U.S. Marnish Radio is part of designnetwork.org, exclusive architecture and design podcasts reaching creative listeners worldwide. Hi there, I'm Nina Freelon. My new CD is Time Traveler, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Marcel Breuer was one of several architects who brought European modernism to the U.S. He was known for hundreds of projects, including the Atlanta Public Library, the Whitney Museum in New York, the Pirelli Building in New Haven, the Housing and Urban Development Building in Washington, D.C., and many iconic houses in Massachusetts and Connecticut. No one was more passionate than Breuer about his work, except for maybe Rufus Stillman, who commissioned four houses over the years. Joining us today is James Crump, the author of Breuer's Bohemia, a new Marcel Breuer book and movie. Later on, we'll have a few minutes with architect Frank Harmon. And now, here's your host, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Thank you, Tom. There's a famous annual secret party in North Carolina that's been going on for decades. The location moves around, but it is always held secret until the invitations go out. And then the guests are asked to keep that location to themselves. Only the coolest people in the creative class are invited, and they like to keep it that way. The event is called the Boogie, or as my friend Lewis Clark used to call it, the Boogie. Lewis passed away recently in his 90s, one of the most accomplished landscape architects in America. Naturally, with his charming British accent and artistic talent, he was a frequent guest at the Boogie. Musicians, architects, writers, poets, actors, makers, and their partners spend a few days over a holiday weekend in their own wonderful bohemia, camping, dancing, singing, performing, creating wonderful meals together, and perhaps dropping their clothes for a swim in a beautiful pond. It's quite a thing. The events of the weekend and the general vibe are always well-managed and planned. There's drinking, and a few other recreational chemicals, of course, and prolific hooking up. Clearly, this is not a gathering for bankers or accountants, or nerds. Lewis's passing recently reminded me of those years in the 90s when I first heard about the boogie and desperately wanted to be invited. Though I was in the bohemian orbit through boogie-adjacent pursuits such as swing dancing, my nerd ship never landed on the planet. (laughs) As the saying goes, they just weren't that into me. Looking back, this was an excellent decision on the part of the boogie nation. I was never going to be cool enough, or my personality laid back enough, or my social skills honed enough, or my artistic abilities creative enough to be a contributing citizen of this temporarily blissful sovereign state. So after a while, instead of moping, I threw my own party. boy. That was about 110 parties ago. <laughs> we have one every month called Thirst for Architecture here at U.S. Modernist in North Carolina. Subscribe to our newsletter at usmarnist.org and come. And thank you, Boogie Nation, for saving me for myself. U.S. Marnist Radio is underwritten by Wendy Robineau and Don Beskin and by Marnist Realtor Angela Roll. Episode 4, A New Hope. It is a dark time as bulldozers from the evil galactic empire destroy millions of modernist houses. Meanwhile, across the galaxy, rebel spies led by Princess Angela Roll have stolen plans for the Empire's ultimate weapon, the Giga Mansion. Ooh. A house so large, it can wipe out entire neighborhoods. <laughs> Wanted by the Imperial fleet, Princess Angela Roll races toward her home planet, Bjarke, hoping to find reinforcements from the ancient order of Cyark that have been hidden there since the 2100s. If the Giga Mansion can be destroyed, Princess Angela will save modernism and restore great architecture to the galaxy. Meanwhile, back on Earth, her great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother, modernist realtor Angela Roll, uses the force of her real estate experience and architectural training to defend modernism. 
Plus, she's pretty good with a lightsaber. <laughs> Reach modernist realtor Angela Roll at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L or 919-995-0550. Or just send a hologram. You'll be able to do that pretty soon, I would think. <laughs> That's going to be our next sort of, you know, high-tech thing. We'll be all sending holograms to each other. James Crump grew up in rural Indiana with dreams of living in New York City, which he achieved. He attended Indiana University and the University of New Mexico and is a film director, writer, producer, and art historian and curator. He has written numerous books and produced documentary films on iconoclastic subjects such as Herb Ritz, William de Kooning, and our very own Senator Jesse Helms' favorite artist, Robert Maplethorpe. This year, he turns his attention to a new book and feature-length documentary, both with the title Breuer's Bohemia. Welcome, James. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, George. So before we get started on architecture, tell our audience about artist Robert Maplethorpe and how Republican Senator Jesse Helms did cultural battle. Well, I was fascinated with Maplethorpe from the very beginning. I, I was introduced to his work. I, I attend his 1988 one-person exhibition at the Whitney Museum of Art in New York City. And in fact, he was actually in the galleries that day. He, was, he wasn't going to live much longer. He was in a wheelchair, and he was voyeuristically watching the people take in the exhibition and really responding to their, to their responses to his, you know, some very challenging photographs. And that just sort of led to a discovery of his work. And I later ended up publishing two books about Robert's work. And then I subsequently directed a film, which was really focused on his relationship with the collector and patron and curator, Sam Wagstaff. So what was Jesse Helms' problem with Maplethorpe? Well, I think if you look at the cultural wars of that particular moment, uh, they used Robert Maplethorpe, they used Andre Serrano, another contemporary photographer, as kind of a political football to advance a very, very conservative right-wing agenda for the arts. And so I, that's, that's what I think is, first and foremost, the most important thing. And then it's a matter of looking at the pictures, because while Maplethorpe was known for these very, very provocative, very sexualized, you know, homoerotic images, you know, some explicitly sexual. He was also known for doing a, you know, a host of different kinds of works, for instance, floral photography or incredible portraiture. But they kind of used that as a, a kind of an albatross to throw around him to kind of frame him exclusively in that uh, genre. Wasn't one of the issues that he was uh, the beneficiary of some federal funding for the arts? I think it was, yeah, you're right, Tom. I think it was the NEA had given him some kind of grant yeah. and Helms the was National, upset. The, well, the National Endowment for the Arts underwrote an exhibition called The Perfect Moment, which is actually a subsequent exhibition from the, the Whitney Museum. It's actually a, an exhibition that, that travels around posthumously. He, he passes away, and that, uh, that show travels to Washington, D.C., and it goes to Cincinnati, Ohio, where it became a lightning rod for um, the challenges that these photographs presented. And the director of that museum was, was uh, accused of I forget what the exact accusations were, but it had to do with obscenity charges and had to fight that. The Center for um, Contemporary Art or the CAC in Cincinnati and Dennis Berry, who was then the director, had to fight off those charges. And in fact, they were they were successful and, and victorious in doing so. And looking back through your, your history, James, it seems like you started documenting artists and their work. When did you start shifting towards architecture? Well, I started studying architecture in graduate school, but I, I've been an aficionado of, of architecture since I was a really young person. Um, I didn't really make a shift per se, but this, I would say Breuer's Bohemia is my first real foray into architecture, especially the book is the first, my first scholarly contribution to this field. But I've always you know, made huge efforts to look at architecture you know, wherever I travel. Modernism is something I've been fascinated with for years and years, but you know, contemporary architecture as well. And I've had the good fortune of meeting a lot of architects over the years and having conversations with them. And I also study with some wonderful scholars of, of the history of architecture, uh, Sarah Burns, for instance, at Indiana University, and Christopher Mead at the University of New Mexico. And from those people and from my interactions with architects, I just, you know, the, the passion and the um, enthusiasm for this field just continue to grow. And so this was an opportunity for me to kind of step into the field more in a more scholarly way and in a more filmic way, more of a motion picture way. So I've been very interested in architecture, but this is my first sort of foray into it formally. 
For those that don't know about Marcel Breuer, give us a quick overview of how he came to prominence in the U.S. Well, that was something that really fascinated me in a profound way was that Breuer has this really incredible relationship with Walter Gropius. He comes to the United States in 1938. He's essentially a kind of partner of Gropius professionally, but he's also teaching at the Harvard University uh, Graduate School of Design. And um, they do several projects together. And at some point around 1941, they, they break up over some acrimonious event that happens in the graduate school. And Breuer begins to distance himself from Gropius. And then a few years later, in 1946, he leaves Harvard altogether and goes to New York City to open up his office. And that, that is really an interesting time. His career just starts to take off. His output gets very, very exciting. And for me, the other part of the equation is Rufus Stillman, who you mentioned in the introduction. Their intersection was very, very, very interesting and had profound implications for both men, professionally and personally. Um, their businesses were taking off simultaneously at the same time. They were going global, essentially. Rufus Stillman introduces Boyer to a lot of different kinds of future clients, friends, family, corporations, municipalities. And from that relationship, a lot of architecture is designed and built uh, with Rufus Stillman's patronage. So that was really what attracted me to this story was this intrigue and seeing this trajectory of, of Boyer once he leaves he leaves Gropius first and has a very difficult time during the war years of establishing his eponymous office. But once he goes to New York City, things really change. And then it really changes even further a couple of years later when he's commissioned by Philip Johnson, the Museum of Modern Art, to do the first house in the museum garden, the exhibition house from 1949, which was accompanied by a catalog authored by Peter Blake. Those events had enormous influence on the trajectory, the subsequent trajectory of Breuer's career, and it was chiefly focused at that point on residential architecture. Breuer's exhibition at MoMA attracted tens of thousands of people who came to see that house. Yes, it was. Uh, I think at, at the time it was maybe the most successful exhibition of its of the moment, and that's in fact where Rufus Stillman is introduced, along with many other enthusiasts of the new modernist architecture. That's where Rufus and his wife, Leslie Stillman, first encountered that house. And and in a way, the rest is history because they go on to do scores of projects together and they go on to collaborate with uh, third party patrons as well. And um, it's a very, very interesting story, which we try to tell in a very cinematic way in the film, of course. But then I, I did this book with the Monticelli Press and Fiden which in a way addresses the various detailed layers of the relationships and of the history that can't be included in a motion picture. What was Stillman's background? How did he come into this? Well, Stillman, he comes back from from World War II. He grew up in New York City, a rather affluent household. He marries and then he goes off to, as a first lieutenant, he goes off to World War II. He's one of the tank battalions. And He's seriously injured in a tank battle. He loses the lower portion of his left leg. And he comes back to the United States. Of course, he's disillusioned. And he begins to envision for himself a life that's better, something that's better for himself, better for his family, better for his community. And he was very, very fascinated by, you know, he was swept up by the spirit of modernism and, and modernist architecture, and in fact, modern art, and began collecting art and go into exhibitions and began to think about having a family and building, you know, a kind of house that very few people at that time had experienced firsthand. And so he, he encounters this, he'd already been studying architecture, of course, and and fine art, but when he experiences this one-to-one scale exhibition house at MoMA, he just gets very turned on and, and driven and convinced that that's what he wants to do. And it's the first of, of many projects that he, he undertakes with Marcel Breuer. So what was house number one like and where was it located? House number one is on Beecher Lane in Litchfield. It's a few, maybe, maybe it's a half a mile from the Litchfield Green, the center of Litchfield, Connecticut. And the house itself is, to me, it's one of the masterworks, even though it's an early work by Breuer. Not, not so early, but an early work in this phase. It's a very, very low profile house that's built into a hillside. It's very, very rectilinear very clean lines. It's surrounded by this beautiful landscape. And Rufus and his wife uh, were very, trying to be very discreet because the locals weren't so interested in this kind of architecture. In fact, there was some you know, pushback. And so they, they built this house 
off of maybe a quarter mile off the main North Street. And it left an impression, as I said, there was nothing like it of its kind in Litchfield or anywhere else in that region. And it was a house for a family. It was binuclear, meaning that the parents would have their quarters upstairs and the children, there ended up being three children that lived in that house, lived below. And this is called uh, was, binuclear? Yeah, that was the word for it. Wow. It basically that, was yeah, you, you a, put the parents in one end and the kids in another. <laughs> exactly. It's a um, concept that Breuer comes up with and refines over the years, and it, it's something that you see frequently in that period of time. And um, that house underscores that kind of separation. It's appointed with a pool. You know, it's, it's not a large house, but it's a very, very elegant house with lots of light, lots of glazing. There's a spiral staircase that takes you downstairs. There's also some wonderful outdoor spaces. There's, a, there's actually two exterior terraces, which are wonderful to, to stand on. And the north one actually leads down, the stairwell leads down to the pool. And you go right into the, the back area where the pool is. So it's a very, very beautiful, very elegant, understated in lots of ways. It's just very, very refined, minimal, a minimalist box, essentially. And it's, I think it's very beautiful. It even holds up today, I think. Now, what happened that caused Stillman to want to commission a second house, Stillman Two? Well, the children were growing up. They got into Stillman House One around 1951 when it was completed. And um, after almost a decade and a half, the family's growing. Some of the children are going off to school, leaving the household. Stillman's very ambitious. He's, he's one of these kinds of people who have to stay busy with projects. And he and Leslie go on a, a vacation with Marcel Breuer to Southern Europe. They go to Hungary and see some of the areas where, where Breuer actually grew up, and then they end up in Greece and Italy. And Breuer introduces him to vernacular architecture, the architecture of that region. And they see you know, stucco and stone buildings, residential properties. And um, again, he gets, he gets very turned on and very you know energetic about this kind of dwelling. And they come back and he asks, Marcel Breuer to draw plans for something like this. And Breuer built Stillman House 2, which is completed in 1966. And it's in a way, it's a little bit of more of an overlooked property, but I think a masterwork. It's a very, very unusual building. It's probably the most Mediterranean of Breuer's residential output. These two volumes sitting on this stone base, this freestone base with a courtyard in the middle. And it's white stucco mixed with that beautiful Connecticut local stone that's available. And it's built into this hillside on 10 acres, just a gorgeous rambling property that it sits on. And it's rather fortress-like. And so that's the story behind that house, which I go into in the film. And it's also more detailed in the book, but it's a very, very interesting house. And I understand the current owner and his partner are really cool. Um, the current owner is is myself and my partner, Ronnie Sassoon, who's a, oh, yeah. who's a real, yeah. real enthusiast. <laughs> Ronnie, she is a fabulous enthusiast and passionate modernist kind of personality. And uh, in 2016, we were very fortunate to be able to acquire that property. In fact, that's what, in a way, launched this film and book project, because we began to meet other owners of Boyer Design Properties. And in turn, we were introduced to the offspring of some of these families that commissioned Breuer. And the stories just kept mounting and mounting. And we decided this sounds, you know, this seems like it could be a very interesting story. That's not simply, you know, a straight academic story about architecture. It's one that's very colorful, filled with cinematic tension, with behind the scenes stories about how these buildings came into being and, and the various relationships behind them. But uh, it's a good question. <laughs> Your partner, Ronnie, this is not her first modernist rodeo. She had a Richard Neutra house. She had a Richard Neutra house called the Singleton House, which maybe is, you know, that is the masterwork. It's kind of, I consider that kind of a museum. And she sold that to Francois Pinot, Pinot Sr. Mm-hmm. Around, I think that was around 2012. That's when I first met Ronnie. And then she subsequently purchased another a much smaller, very sexy Richard Neutra house called the Levitt House, which was completed in 1961, where we live today in Los Angeles. Very, very beautiful house. Again, a more overlooked house. But before that, she also had a uh, Harold Levitt house in Beverly Hills and um, the Boyer House in Litchfield now. We also have a loft, a historic loft from 1970 in, in Soho in Manhattan that was owned by Jack Seglick and Joel Dean, who was the other part of Dean and DeLuca, where the Dean and DeLuca cookbook oh, was yeah, uh, right. designed. And right. all those shops. So, yeah, so a 
beautiful open loft that takes you back as a time capsule to 1970 because we have not, uh, all we've done is modernize some of the, the appliances, but the open plan is still there existing and it houses a you know, wonderful collection of art and design. So yeah, she's no amateur to modernist studies or, or being very involved in, in renovating, owning and preserving these, uh, these historical, iconic residential dwellings. I was surprised she didn't appear in the film. Well, she's really very much involved behind the scenes. She's, she's a producer of the film with me. She's also a production designer, and she's very, very involved with editing the book that I produced. And uh, we both prefer to be behind the camera. Okay. Well, in a certain way, she is appearing in the film. Yeah. It's her work. She is. Right. Yeah, it's her work, exactly. She's represented in the film in a, in a more metaphoric, symbolic way. I found a great quote by her former husband, Vidal Sassoon, of the Hair Care Empire, who once said, Architects have always been my heroes. I could not have been more honored than when I met Marcel Breuer, and he told me he knew my work. And Rim Koolhaas said he had one of my original cutting books in his library. That's a great connection. It's a wonderful connection, and I've, I've heard that anecdote a few times, and it's a wonderful story. You know, Videl's in a restaurant. He's, he's entertaining a, a table, and he recognizes Marcel Breuer coming into this dining room, and he excuses himself and goes over and introduces himself to Breuer, and Breuer invites him to sit down, and they sat down and had hours worth, worth of conversation about architecture. Later on, there, and there's an interesting connection to Bauhaus, and there was actually a, you know, an important exhibition in Dessau, called Videl Sassoon und das Bauhaus, which is a, an exhibition that's, that shows the contrasts and the affinities and the juxtapositions of some of Videl's hair designs, which were revolutionary, as revolutionary as the architecture that it's being compared with. And that's a, a fairly historically important monograph. It's out of print, of course, but you can find it if you look for it. Our research team, which is really good, told me that you are inspired by Andy Warhol's interview magazine. It was this portal into this new world that you want to be part of. It's true. It's true. I mean, I was growing up, you mentioned I was growing up in Indiana where I lived. I was not able to find the kinds of experiences that I thought I would be able to experience in a larger, you know, metropolitan place like New York City. But we did have, you know, a small newsstand. And one of the things they got, and this is, you know, in the 1970s, was Interview Magazine. And I became a devotee of it and read it religiously page by page every month. And uh, through that, learned a lot about what was happening in the city at the time and, and got turned on myself by the stories of, of people in the arts and the entertainers and musicians and filmmakers and the whole myriad of interesting characters who, who populated New York City. And um, it was very inspirational. It turned me on to studying Warhol. Over the years, I still look at Warhol whenever I have an opportunity, and I have a huge Warhol library. But yeah, it was very inspirational. And um, it gave me a lot of ideas, shall we say. Did you ever see Nest magazine? I did. It was a fabulous magazine. Very, very interesting and, and very, very I don't, kind of opulent in comparison to you know, to the Warhol, especially the early Warhol interview. That's no longer produced, right? It's, out, it's no, no longer we've been trying to get that guy to come on the show and talk about the magazine because it was just like no other magazine I think has ever existed. It was not a Warhol magazine, was it? No, it was produced by a different person. But inspired, in a way? It seemed, to me. I yeah. just wanted to know your opinion of it. I think it's a very experiential kind of immersive publication. It was When it came out, it was the closest thing to, to Floor Cole's Flair magazine from the 1950s, where you had multiple stocks of, of printing paper, different you know objects being hand-affixed to the interior of the book. It's really kind of really exotic printing techniques and cutouts and sometimes even the foldouts. And I think it's, at the time, it was something very, very novel. And uh, the only precedent would be something like, you know, Flair Magazine. I actually have a copy and, of Flair Magazine in my office. That's great. It's a neat publication. Uh -huh. All right. Well, let's talk about the movie, Breuer's Bohemia. Where will people be able to see that? Will that be on a documentary circuit? Will it be available on streaming somewhere? Do you have any plans at this point? It had its premiere, its world premiere at the Provincetown Internet International Film Festival in June, which was 20 minutes uh, from Breuer's original Wellfleet Cottage. We thought that was apropos to show it there. And it was one of the first live film festivals after the pandemic was winding down. And the next 
screenings will be at the Architecture and Design Film Festival in New York, October 1st and 2nd, which has iterations in Los Angeles, Vancouver, Toronto, and and Washington, D.C. through the rest of the year. And then it's being featured at the Rotterdam Architect, the Architecture Film Festival Rotterdam, AFFR, and that will be screening in late October. And uh, we have some other plans that way, but it will release for streaming on demand in early October on Vimeo and other leading streaming platforms. So people will be able to see it in their home entertainment. Uh, at a theater near your living room. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Which is, a you know, since we've gone through this really challenging time of the pandemic, it had incredibly profound impacts on our viewership and how we look at motion pictures. And it seems to me that it's going to take a long time if, if it ever comes back to uh, the way we looked at cinema going to a theater and you know, sitting down in a seat and eating popcorn. It's going to be a long time before we get back to any kind of normalcy there. So this is an avenue. Streaming is an avenue for, it's a great avenue for the audience and it's a great avenue for the filmmakers you know, to get the work out there and create the audience. Now, Rufus Stillman, as a patron of Breuer, not only helped advance his architectural agenda, but also Rufus was experimenting on his own with different kinds of social constructs that the movie explores. He was. I mean, it was a change in time. It was the beginning, perhaps, the very on the cusp of the sexual revolution. A lot of other social changes happening after World War II, as you know. And Rufus is really the catalyst for change. He's a partisan for the new. And what he does, inspired by Breuer, because he spends time with Breuer in Wellfleet, where Breuer himself had created a kind of bohemian enclave, Rufus has this idea, he begins to envision a similar kind of, of enclave for himself, and he forms a community of like-minded individuals and that, you know, that essentially they coalesced around liberal democratic politics, you know, local ecological concerns, um, the anti-war movement among a myriad of other socially progressive ideas. And through that, you know, relationships are developed. And um, I think what you're alluding to are other things that happen socially, some of the more sexually provocative elements in the film, you know, in the personal lives of these patrons, which include Rufus, but also you know, other patrons that Breuer is introduced to, like Andrew the Gagarin, who builds a series of houses as well with Breuer as the architect. It was a time of bohemian pleasure, decadent parties, you know, heavy drinking, adultery. These are issues that you're alluding to, broken marriages, and in in one case, suicide. And for me, you know, when I was gathering these stories, I was getting very, you know, interested in this as a narrative and and a kind of raw components of a movie. It struck me that it was like the filmmaker Ang Lee's The Ice Storm meets Frank Perry's The Swimmer. (laughs) <laughs> which are both you know, set, set in Connecticut. They're both set in Connecticut during the exact same span of time examined in the film. And the Stillmans and the Gagarins, these were, for me, they were eccentric, decadent versions of the quintessential affluent suburban families. But you know, underneath the idyllic visage of Breuer's exacting mid-century architecture, turns out real lives were being torn apart in some instances. And there was dysfunction and that's what actually interested me to get this going as a film because I was, I was really curious about what the relationships were, the, the, the relationships of the commissioning patrons and the architecture itself, whether it embodied or whether it rejected these utopian promises of modernism, and this positive utopian thinking, because these people end up having you know their normal lives that are flawed with um, various challenges, personal and professional challenges. So it was like these hard-driving patrons, they struggled, you know, with personal shortcomings and loss. And I was curious if this was somewhat connected to the architecture itself. I I didn't come to any conclusion, but I think the storytelling was very interesting. And what we mined from the subjects who happened to be children that grew up in these houses was very interesting and and fascinating and, and helped us produce the narrative for the feature documentary. It appears that that Breuer himself was much more on the straight and narrow than some of his patrons. Well, I think he was very, very tapped down to some extent. He was he shared the same kind of leftist concerns. He was someone who was interested in um, diversity. In the in the book, I point out that his firm in the nineteen fifties and sixties had a disproportionate number of women and women of color. And in fact, Breuer was the the architect who hired the first licensed black 
female architect. Beverly Green. Beverly Green, who he, he assigned to the UNESCO project. But Breuer, you know, he was also, in his earlier days, there's stories of his philandering that comes out in my writing in the book. He's somewhat of a, of a womanizer early in his life, but I think he genuinely loves women. I'm not forgiving him or letting him off the hook, but I think he's, he genuinely loves and respects women. And I think that's pointed out in his embrace of female architects, which at the time was very unusual. So, yeah, he's, he's a little more tapped down. He's older, too. You know, he's much older than this generation that's commissioning for these fabulous new houses in the 1950s. He's older than Stillman and Gagarin. Yes, he's much older. What happened to Breuer? How did his career end? Was he one of these that died early like Sarnin? Well, he was in such a breakneck pace. You know, his output was so prolific, as you pointed out in the introduction. He built and was involved with so many collaborative projects that, you know, after years of that and being on the road, constantly on the road as a kind of prototypical star architect, I'm sure it was very wearing and very draining, and he was driven by the work. He saw his family maybe a few days each month. And so that took a toll, I think, physically. And, you know, in the late 70s, he basically retires from the eponymous firm, and he's later diagnosed with some heart ailment, and he ends up dying in 1981. But he's still doing his thing. He's still trying to work. He's still spending lots of time in Wellfleet. And there's photographs of Rufus Stillman with Breuer at the very end of his life in Wellfleet, you know, taking care of his old friend, nursing him. And um, Breuer would come into New York City, and they'd go out for scotch and you know, reminisce about the old days. And they, they really loved each other. And, and Rufus Stillman, in fact, was one of the keynote speakers at Breuer's Memorial at the Whitney Museum. Breuer and Gropius had a great relationship in the beginning, but kind of like Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, they fell apart. Well, they did and they didn't. You know, there was this, there was this rupture, this blow-up that happens in 1941, and it's really ego-driven on Breuer's part because Breuer's, he's a little myth that uh, Walter Gropius is receiving so much attention and so much acclaim when their firm, their partners in a firm, they're doing quite a few projects actually in that moment, and, and a lot of the design work is falling on Breuer's shoulders, and I think Breuer resented that, and I think he was really very, very hungry for more attention. And that's what precipitates this uh, this breakup. And for a few years, you know, they weren't really speaking to each other. There was kind of this, you know, this very childish behavior on Breuer's part, I think, very immature. But they do patch the fences and, and get back together as friends. And, and I point that out as well in the book. And they spend a lot of time together, especially in Wellfleet. And they, they travel together and they see each other whenever they can because they're both busy. And of course, Gropius is getting older and he's winding down. But they did mend the fence, and they did become close again, and they spent time, you know, vacationing together. And I think they genuinely loved each other. And I think when you when you genuinely love, if you're a man and you have this this great relationship with another person, another man, homosocial friendship, and you break up, oftentimes you will get back together because you miss that person because it's they're one of the few people in your life that you can get along with or have a conversation with. And I think that's what the situation was with Gropius and Breuer. And Gropius died, what, in 69 or 70? So He died in 69. We had on Gropius' granddaughter a while back as one of our guests. I saw that. And she was talking about the great Tom Lehrer song that talked about yes. Gropius' first wife, the song called Alma. Oh, which, Alma uh, Mahler, yes. Yeah, which is yeah. Uh, fun to look up on YouTube for us architectural nerds. Well, it's also just an interesting and incredibly fascinating relationship, a really hot, heated relationship, and also on his part, and Gropius' part, a very obsessive relationship with Alma Mahler, which kind of rears its head throughout the rest of his adult life, even when he's married to Issa. You know, Alma Mahler shows up, and, and uh, he can't really quit the relationship. There's not a clean break, and she's, she was very influential on him, and he was obsessed with her, as other men were as well. But yeah, it's very interesting, but um, I'll have to check out that recording. Did Gropius and Brohr and Mies van der Rohe and sort of the gang that immigrated from Europe, did they hang out with American architects like Frank Lloyd Wright, or was it more of a competition kind of thing? I think they were all searching for relationships with, you know, other ar with local architects, you know, American architects. I, you know, not all of them got along, especially someone like Frank Lloyd Wright. But, you know, and there's acrimony between, you know, an architect like, even though Philip Johnson commissions Breuer for the house in the museum garden, 
he really irritates Gropius and Royer in a lot of different ways, especially his uh, Ash Street house, which is his graduate thesis house, and also you know, his, uh, his fascist leanings in the 1930s and 40s. But, you know, there's lots of correspondence between American architects and these Europeans. If you look in the archives, there's, and I think there's an opportunity for them all to learn from each other and, and to stay abreast of what other people are doing and, in fact, learn from each other. So, yeah, I don't know if they're hanging out so much, but there were plenty of American architects who were invited by Breuer up to Wellfleet, and that's the chapter I know best. And there's lots of correspondence that indicates that there, there was this kind of reciprocity and friendship. The book Breuer's Bohemia comes out on September 14th and is available through all bookstore near you. James, thank you so much for joining us. Please say hello to Ronnie. I hope to meet the two of you sometime in person, maybe when I'm in New York at the Architecture and Design Film Festival this fall. Thank you so much, George. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure being on your program. And um, I, too, look forward to meeting you. And I certainly will give Ronnie your best regards. Thank you very much. And now, a few minutes with Frank Harmon, reading from his book, Native Places. Creek Children When I imagine the perfect classroom, it has a creek running through it. You see, I grew up by a creek. I discovered Buffalo Creek near our home when I was six years old and played there until I was twelve. I can't remember much of what I learned in school during those years, but I'll never forget what I learned at Buffalo Creek. Children raised by creeks are never bored. Creek children don't know about learning by rote. Neither are they conditioned to working nine to five. Berries are their first discoveries, and birds' nests, and watching the stars come out. Later, they discover books. To creek children, learning is discovery, not instruction. Occasionally, I return to my creek where the water is still clear and the crawfish are plentiful. No place I've ever known has been nicer to me than Buffalo Creek. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Wendy Robineau and Don Beskin and by modernist realtor Angela Roll. Okay, Tom, close us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 8,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist Carrie Cesarino researches guests while drinking Guinness and settling petty disputes over candy, cereal, and who gets to wear the blue hat today. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild, George, and I'll be back soon with another laid-back, artistic, at-one-with-the-universe, bohemian edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Live long and prosper. <laughs>